So what we'd like to do for our um, keynote presentation is actually to have uh, this year's Clark Prize recipient, John Crittenden, come up and and introduce our keynote speaker. The keynote speaker was his nominator, and we always like to get uh, the nominator to our conference, do an introduction and give a talk. It's been a great way to get people involved with what we're doing. So I'd like for John to come up, and I'm gonna give you one sentence on John because we're gonna talk a lot about him later. But uh, John Crittenden has been the director of the Brooks Byers Institute for Sustainable Systems at Georgia Tech since 1908. That's all I'm going to say. John, I know you're here. Come on up. Thank you for being here, and congratulations on being this, this year's recipient of the Clark Prize. Thank you, John. So he doesn't have a presentation, so we'll just leave that up with the background. Okay. Well, thank you so much for... Uh, Everything you guys are uh, have really been an inspiration to me, and um, it's been great w working with many of you over the years. So um, I would like to introduce uh, Joe Hughes. Maybe he doesn't need much of an introduction, but I uh, thought I would say a few words about Joe. Um, <clears throat> uh, Joe received his PhD and MS degrees um, from the University of Iowa in civil and environmental engineering and a Bachelor of Arts from Cornell College uh, in Chemistry. He is currently the Dean of Engineering and Distinguished University Professor at Drexel University. Um, prior to this appointment, he was served as my chair at uh, Georgia Tech, and he was really fastidious in recruiting me, and I'm really glad that he did get me to come to Georgia Tech. It's been a great experience for me. Um, he also... Uh, was at Rice University and um, served there as all the ranks up through chair. So um, let's see what else here. Um, at uh, let's see here. Yes, uh, Joe was a registered uh, professional engineer and is a diplomat by eminence in the American Academy of Environmental Engineering. Um, he received uh, awards for his teaching and research activities, including the Georgia Engineer of the Year in Education, the McKee Medal from the Water Environment Federation, the Huber Prize from ASCE, um, the Duncan, Charles Duncan Award for Outstanding Academic Achievement at Rice University, and is a member of Chi Epsilon. Um, and was twice recognized as the ASC Outstanding Professor for the Outstanding Professor Award at Rice University. Um, he's published ex uh, extensively in a variety of journals, and um, he promised me in his talk today that he would make it more interesting than an isotherm, so I'm interested to hear what he has to say, for those of you who know what an isotherm is. And of course, uh, Joe comes to us with many Iowa connections. I don't know where Jerry Schnorr is, but Jerry convinced him to move into the environmental field in the first place, and Rich Valentine and was a professor of Joe's and so on. So there's some connections here with, with Iowa. So anyway, with that, I'll uh, let Joe come to the stage and give his presentation. Uh, it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here today. This is the first time I've had a chance to be at the Clark Prize Conference, and uh, it's really amazing to see uh, the people who are here. Uh, it's wonderful to see the students that are here as well. Uh, you've got a, a tremendous opportunity to interact with really the leaders in the field. I hope you take full advantage of that. Um, I'm going to start by clarifying something. Um, that is me. <laughs> Um, I became dean. <laughs> Things change. In particular, your hairline. But in fact, that, that was me uh, a few years ago. So uh, th things happen. Um, I, I have no presentation for you today uh, on the screen. And, and I hope that's not a distraction for you. I just wanted to talk to you today. Um, about what the title of my talk is, is Water and Sanitation in the Developing World. 
But really what I want to talk about is conflict. Um, and, and I'll clarify that in a moment. But conflict is not meant for PowerPoint. Conflict is meant for pictures and words. And so I'm avoiding the use of any, uh, anything on the screen, and I just want to talk with you today. So the, the issues of water and sanitation in the developing world are well documented. Everybody can read how many people are not served, how many people need to receive uh, improved water sources, how many people need sanitation. Um, it's, you, you, you can't avoid reading it on the internet if you, if you try. Um, but the, the, the issues of sanitation, water, and when I say water in the developing world, it goes well beyond drinking water. It goes into water resources and what water does with regard to nutrition and basic day-to-day -day life. Um, and so when I'm speaking about this topic, I'm going to be speaking about it from a non-U.S. perspective. Um, I've spent an enormous amount of time in sub-Saharan Africa working on issues of water and sanitation. And it is so dramatically different than in the United States or in the developed world, really, that it's sometimes difficult to put into words. And so why is it different? Is the chemistry different? No. As far as I can tell, the density of water is the same everywhere. Are the physics different? No, absolutely not. Is the challenge of creating safe drinking water different? No. We, we've kind of worked on that for a while, and we know some things about that. Is it perfect? It's not. And we'll talk about more of that today. All of the things that we know and we think of as environmental engineers and, and people who work in the area of water and sanitation, it's all the same from a technological perspective. It's incredibly different from the context in which problems are solved. And let me try to, let me try to explain that. We work in a regulatory environment. We have laws. We have required technologies. We have a huge infrastructure. And I'm not talking about the physical infrastructure. I'm talking about the legal infrastructure that drives what we do. And in many ways, that simplifies things. Now, I know people are going to say, you haven't met the guy i got to work with. It's complicated. I know that. That's always going to be true. But the difference in the developing world is it's not based in a regulatory environment. That's basically non-existent. There are a few things, you, depending on what country you work in, um, there may be a few things that help guide you. Basically, what guides everything is conflict. And so let's talk about what is conflict. War, murder, rape's a big one, uh, robbery, burglary, intimidation, etc. And when you're working in a developing world, you're working around those constraints. It's not, did you meet your 30-30 rule? It's, did you cause a problem that results in additional conflict? And so the, 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 the talk I want to give today is two case studies that I've been involved in that really highlight the issue of conflict as it relates to water, in this case more water resources than drinking water, um, and sanitation. One is in Angola, uh, one is in South Africa. We could talk about some other countries if we want to in Q&A, but those are the two I want to highlight. So, Angola. Uh, most people don't know where Angola is. It's on the western coast of Africa, just south of the Congo River. There is one little island, so to speak, of Angola that's north of the Congo River called Cabinda. And I'll be talking about Cabinda today. Um, I've been to Angola, I don't know, 30 times probably. Um, it is a tough place. Um, they had a 30-year uh, civil war. It ended in 2002 with a really dramatic assassination. 
Um, and I started working there in 2000, and roughly 2003. Life expectancy for a woman, 27. It's a rough place. Uh, average number of births per woman per lifetime is eight. It's just, it's, 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 it's got more oil than you can imagine. It's got more diamonds than you can imagine. It's got copper reserves that you can't imagine. It's 10 million people and it's horrible. Why I ever went, I don't know. <laughs> I had a professor, a colleague of mine, John knows him, who said, Joe, you're young and foolish, and you're behaving young and foolish. And I think he's right. But anyway, Angola is a tough spot. We started by doing the basics of public health. We closed down the landfills that were open burning dumps. We started to get the waste out of the city with sewers, uh, open sewers, not pipe sewers. And we started a project to get drinking water into the city. Uh, the city is Luanda. The city is uh, about 7 million people. Um, it's a refugee camp. Before the war started, it was about 250,000. So everybody who came in, came in as a refugee. Um, it's, a, it's a really challenging engineering environment. But in the city of, of Luanda, the conflict is more political than it is with guns in hand. Whereas in Cabinda, it's very much guns in hand. The, uh, the Civil War continues in Cabinda, and the Civil War in Cabinda um, is largely based around water, believe it or not. Um, if you're in Cabinda, uh, dress casually, but it's, as you look out, it's on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, and if you look out, all you see is oil derricks. They're all operated by U.S. oil firms, and they're flaring all the time, and you look out there, and you just see what's going on with regard to wealth generation. When you come in, in shore to Cabinda, it is incredibly poor. I mean, a dollar a day would be doing pretty well in Cabinda. And the conflict that is taking place is based around water. Why is it around water? Well, all of the coastal watersheds have been destroyed. And the coastal watersheds were the basis of food. Protein, fish, shrimp, crab, what have you. But the basis of what you ate has all been destroyed. And I was called in to show that the oil companies had caused the problem, that their operations had ruined the beachfronts, had killed the mangroves, and destroyed the food availability of the residents of Cabinda. Well, as it turns out, that wasn't right. It wasn't the oil companies. Now, I'm not saying that there couldn't have been something that was done improperly, but there was nothing that was done in the catastrophic nature of what, is of a, what, you, what you observe today. We did a study to try to evaluate the role of oil in the loss of the coastal mangroves of Cabinda. We couldn't find any. We could not find anything that could relate oil production to the loss of the mangroves. So we scratched our heads and we said, what, can we, what is it? And we did a very, very complicated hydrologic study of the, the watershed basins along the oceans of Cabinda. And what we found is that it was human intervention and infrastructure placement that had ruined the ecosystems of this region. Primarily road building, and road building that was done incorrectly. So I flew to Cabinda, and I met with the governor, and the governor said, wanted to see my presentation, and I showed it to him, and he declared a national holiday so that everybody could come and see my talk. 
And so standing next to a building with a sheet hanging on it and a Honda generator, I ran my laptop and I showed my presentation. Today I'm standing here with nobody around me. At that presentation, I literally had about 30 guys with guns. It was really, really intimidating. And I told the people of Cabinda, who were relieved from their jobs that day, it's not the oil companies, it's the roads. And you can't believe what I was, the names I was called. It was really, really interesting. And I said, no, you gotta trust me. They said, we don't trust you at all. And I said, well, let's, let, let me go show you. And I'd identified five pinch points in one specific watershed where road building had changed the hydrology of the region, which changed the water resources of the region, which resulted in conflict. Um, a US oil company was kind enough to provide us with a helicopter. Um, they were really hoping I was right. I was so scared, I can't tell you, um, because if I was wrong, I wasn't sure what was going to happen to me. Um, and we flew to five different points in this watershed with the governor, armed guards, etc. As it turns out, we were right. We used satellite array data. We used the best data we could get from the CIA. We used the best data we could get from the space shuttle. As it turns out, our modeling was right. And um, as it turns out, everything was based around poor engineering design, incorrect engineering design, and cutting corners in engineering design. And it was cutting those corners that made all the difference. And I'll give you one specific example, a culvert. I went to this one location in a very remote part of this large watershed, and I told the people there is a pinch point for drainage at this one specific location. And we flew in, and lo and behold, on this dirt path, there was a culvert. And I thought, oh no, I did it wrong. The culvert was completely full of cement. I was really happy. <laughs> and you just, <sighs> anyway, at the end of the day, they gave me an island off the coast of Cabinda. It's called Joe's Island. If you'd like to ca uh, catch malaria, uh, that's where you want to go, because <laughs> that's where I caught malaria. So, um, but my, my point in this whole instance is the, the, the civil war that continues in, in Cabinda is based around water and the types of engineering work that people in this room do in the developed world, but does not translate into the developing world very well. And a lot of times what we do in the developing world is to say, this is enough, but we would never do that here. We would do more. And that example was completely true in uh, everything I've done in Angola. So for the sake of time, I want to move on to my second case study, which is in South Africa. And it's around a very, very different subject matter. It's not around water. It's around sanitation. Um, at the end of apartheid, uh, South Africa said that they would provide sanitation to all the residents of South Africa. They were looking for 99% compliance. And so the, the term I want to use is sanitation access. Access. So you have the ability to get to a sanitation facility when you need to. Now, I will credit the government of South Africa, they have, hit, they have hit that goal based on the World Health Organization definitions of access to sanitation. The number of South African residents that use sanitation technologies is remarkably low. So we have 99% compliance in terms of providing sanitation, and we've got the majority of people who use open field defecation. And you say, what, what's wrong here? Um, and the answer is, is complicated. <laughs> However, the answer lies very much in the role of the engineer. 
and the role of the engineer in creating what met the goal but didn't achieve the results. And similar to what I've tried to outline in the presentation about Angola. So in South Africa, if the average South African shares a toilet with 46 other people, it's communal, so it, only 19% of residents have sanitation within their home. So 80% roughly of South Africans use communal sanitation if they use it at all. Now, can you imagine the conflict that can arise here? Okay, imagine Thanksgiving at your house and the family comes in and you got an extra six or eight people around. How precious is that bathroom? In my home, I go down to the office. It, 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 but can you imagine 46 others every day? You can imagine the conflict between neighbors that arises here. But it goes well beyond that. It is the absolute home for violence against women. An unprotected woman is an absolute target when using the restroom. There's estimates that in South Africa, the chances of a woman below the age of 25 to be raped is over 30%. And much of it centers around sanitation, if you can believe that. And so we did a study in South Africa in a small slum where we interviewed over 1,000 people. And we asked them about the link between technology, a like communal toilet, and what they would like, what scares them, and what could be improved. And it was absolutely, completely predictable. People wanted sanitation in their home. They wanted privacy. More than anything, they wanted safety. It was the issue of conflict that was driving the user preferences for sanitation, clearly. And you'd say, Joe, that's a no-brainer. Of course it's a no-brainer. But you still have to go in and do the work, and you have to prove it. And we were, and John was an absolute integral part of this project. Um, he, we, had a student who lived in South Africa for about a year doing the work. And she built a trust, she was able to talk to the residents, she started learning the language, and she pulled together this huge database of information that came down to very, very straightforward and probably predictable outcomes that said, you know what, if your restroom does not have a door on it and you share it with 46 other people, that's gonna be uncomfortable. If the door on your restroom locks from the outside, and most of them do, they don't lock from the inside, because the idea is to control access into it, not safety within it, you wouldn't want to use that restroom. And if it was a toilet that had no walls around it, sitting next to a busy intersection, very, very few people, and I've got a picture of that actually, very, very few, people, pe very few people want to use it. So it was very fundamental in many ways, but the conflict that arises is at an enormous number of levels. It's amongst neighbors, it's against women, and it's also against the government. And there are riots that take place routinely in South Africa over sanitation. Um, one of the favorite ways to start the riot is to gather as much human feces as you can and throw it into the streets and on the sidewalks so people won't walk, people don't want to be out, those kinds of things. And the next thing that happens is you've got a melee. So the, the issues in the developing world, um, are, they're, they're so different. The chemistry is the same, physics are the same, technology is the same, safe water is the same. It's no different. The issues that dictate how you get there are 
so different. And it is that understanding that I think we need to be better informed upon as we as a profession talk about global, global water issues, um, global health, those kinds of things. It's about conflict. And you have to understand the role of conflict and what humans do. And I'm no expert in it, but I sure have seen it. Um, so a couple key findings, and I'm going to wrap up. Um, better is not good enough. A lot of the work that I see being done in the developing world is, is saying, gosh, it's so horrible. Let's make it incrementally better. A lot of incremental better leads to a lot more conflict. And that's something to think about. Gender inequality is everywhere. And it drives so much of the decision making. And you need to be, people need to be acutely aware of that. And the, the, the last thing I would say is if you are so inspired to work in the developing world, you have to know how to build trust. So much of the work that goes on in the developing world happens one person, goes one time, never goes back. And it doesn't work. And I remember one time I was, I, I can't remember what country it was, but I, I came back for the second time and they said, no one ever comes back. So there's no trust. And so if you are interested in working in these environments, you got to be ready to go and go back and go back and go back. So with that, I hope I've been able to paint a few pictures with words and I hope there's some questions. Thank you. How did you, why did you move away from that model where they work very carefully to manage the safety of the environment and go into such challenging locations where the problems may be uh, as great or greater? Let me, let me make sure I understand the question. Um, working with the, you're talking about working with, uh, in this case, the Peace Corps, but working in environments where it's safer well, uh, my understanding is the Peace Corps will not place people in right. areas where there is danger. And if, the, if danger arises, they, they will move them. And it happened to one of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just curious how you ended up in the, lo the, the dangerous locations that, that you discussed. Because I'm silly and foolish. No, I'm more, more seriously. Um, that's where the problems are acute. That's where you're not working on the fringe. You're working on um, the, the really key central issues. And um, so I'll use Cabinda as, as my example. Um, I've been robbed at gunpoint. I've gotten malaria there. Um, my student, John Fortner, who's now a very successful student, at, or, or professor, not student, at Washington University of St. Louis, uh, I thought for sure I was going to watch him get killed. It, it, in all of that said, we made a pretty big difference there. Were we able to completely restore the problems that had occurred? Probably not. I mean, it takes time to restore ecosystems. Um, was it scary at times? Yeah. Uh, it was pretty scary. and. You'll never forget the sound of an AK-47. The, the point being, though, is that that's where the, the, the heart of the problem is, right? You got to take, you, somehow you got to, if you're a surgeon, you got to take the cancer out, right? The, and I'm not saying that we took the cancer out because it's still a very, very rough place, but I think that if you do not engage in the conflict regions, that you're really avoiding some of the most important issues that are driving the entire uh, challenging environment that you're dealing with when you're dealing with poverty. So the way that we got around that is we hired a huge number, sometimes 10, sometimes 50 
armed guards. And we went into places that most people wouldn't go. It worked out. But to avoid it is to say you're avoiding the really important questions. So I was terrified that my student, Zakia, was going to be working in some of the environments that she worked in. She's female. She obviously was not South African. Um, and at the end of the day, the precautions we used, it all worked out. She's working for Google now. Uh, I don't want to know how much she's making. <laughs> but if anybody would love to steal someone from Google and put her in an academic job, she's the one you want. She's absolutely fearless. She was very, very, very focused on safety. John, would you agree with that? Very focused on safety, despite the environment that she was in. And we protected her to the best that we could do. It's, um, but if you don't walk into those areas and you don't really see what's driving the conflict, the heart of the conflict, you have no opportunity, in my opinion, to make a difference. It, I mean, the type of difference that people want to make. Thank you for that answer. I think it's a very commendable thing that you did, so thank you. Mike Cavanaugh, back here. Joe, uh, those are two uh, very powerful stories, and part of what we do in the world to make it a better place is to generate those kinds of stories. Uh, but there's a lot of initiatives going on right now that are trying to address the water and sanitation challenges, as everybody in this room knows, the sustainable development goals, the any grand challenges, they all have a significant water goal. Sure. And there's the Water for People, and there's the Engineers Without Borders, and there's all the religious groups. I don't know if you're being critical of them or you're stating that their, uh, their contributions are too marginal to really make a difference. Is there a distinction? Oh, I, 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 so I did not ever want to make well, that Well, let me just make, could I, could I ask you to make a distinction sure. between what I would call very high-risk efforts that you undertook versus the... Um, broader uh, approach with a lot of students really excited about trying to address the water and sanitation problems in the world and that those programs are, are well established and going forward and, and so how, how, how would you sort out investment issues uh, going down some of the paths you're you're talking about versus all of these other efforts okay and and, and that's a, a absolutely uh, spot-on question Mike as usual um, you know, I've worked very hard with Bernard Amade on the Engineers Without Borders program. Um, at Rice, we were the second chapter of EWB uh, after Colorado, and I've been very, very active in that program. And it's a tremendous program. It, 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 but I would contend, Mike, and, and this may be a bit provocative, but I would contend that the biggest impact of that program is on our students, not always the community being served. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the service to the community. I'm saying in relative terms, where is the value? Um, when a, We've all, or most of us in the room, have been exposed to severe poverty. And it changes you. And EWB and some of these other programs do that. They provide that exposure. Now, are the outcomes of the projects beneficial? Yes, they are. It, it's varying. Some of them are more uh, sustainable than others. So I'm in no way trying to diminish it. Um, and, the, and the UN goals were very laudable. We're going to miss them completely. We're losing against population growth. We're doing better in water uh, providing, we're losing in sanitation. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa were 4% of the sanitation goals set for 2015. So we're only off by 96%. So the, the, there's a number of groups working in this area, and you're right, Mike, 
And every one of them has absolutely the best intentions. And I would never, ever say anything other than thank you. That said, we have a certain responsibility, in my opinion, in our profession, as leaders in water and sanitation, to think about things in the light of saying, how do you solve the problem? And the first thing people say is, well, we don't have the money. Yeah, but there's enough money to build communal toilets that no one wants to sit in for 30 million people. There was money. There's money that was spent really, really poorly. And so, Mike, don't take my comments as being anything other than trying to say, there's a, we've got to get better at it. That's not to say that the programs you mentioned are not providing amazing outcomes. I, I really believe that they are. But we've got a lot we've got to do, and a lot of the stuff that's been done has been done not so well. Joe, we have a question over here from Vern. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your talk, Joe. Uh, so my question really was along the lines of the impacts of uh, the uh, engineers without borders. <clears throat> Uh, like you, I've seen the very beneficial effect on the students. Uh, you know, students that go overseas, uh, go to the developing countries, benefit uh, greatly. But I've also been concerned about uh, these uh, one-shot projects that maybe are more harmful than they are good because they move people away from a, a, a practice that's, there's, they're managed to exist, uh, they, they're managing to get water, they're managing to do something. The project that the Engineers Without Borders uh, undertakes uh, is not sustainable, so uh, it, the, the, people fo the people there may be uh, less better off afterwards. Um, so it's, this is not to criticize Engineers Without Borders, uh, but I wonder whether uh, we as advisors at universities are uh, uh, leading them in the wrong direction to think that that's a beneficial uh, project to carry out if it's a, a one-off type project. Um, I share your concern um, and I think it's, it's very valid. Um, it's complicated. <coughs> Uh, there's a huge range in projects that organizations like EWB take on, and so I would not want to throw a blanket over all of them. Uh, but there are certain projects that I've reviewed that cause me great concern. Um, and maybe I didn't make the point clear in my discussion, but some of the solutions, quote unquote, to the issues that are trying to be addressed and I would point to sanitation in particular. The outcomes of the uh, projects, and this doesn't have to be just EWB, it could be a range of organizations as Mike laid out for us, um, are, have, have a single success measurement. So for example, a community that has no sanitation services whatsoever, you can find them anywhere in Africa, Central America, large parts of South America, et cetera. Um, and you say, we are going to come in as a group, and I, it can be any group, and we are going to provide pit latrines. So you bring your shovel, and you bring your lumber, you dig a hole, you put up a structure, and you declare victory, right? because your single objective is to provide sanitation where sanitation doesn't exist. Now, is that bad? You don't know. Is it good? You really don't know. Um, there probably is no single sanitation device that causes more uh, violence against women than a latrine. So did you do the right thing? You hope so. 
But the point being is, and, I, and I'm in no way trying to stymie efforts by, by saying that. What I'm trying to say is there's a, there's a different lens that we have to be looking through when we look at the projects that are taking place. So one of the things I've always wanted to see happen. So the problem with the latrines is at night. It's dark, it's isolated, and it's a place where you can be a predator. If they had a light, it would change at least some, something. So one of the projects I had, I, I'm a big fan of Bruce Logan's work on microbial fuel cells, was how do you turn a pit latrine into a fuel cell to light a light bulb around the latrine? That would be a great EWB project. The, the, but but I, what I'm trying to, to not trying, I, I, this was supposed to be more of an inspiration than it, than it <laughs> but my, my point is it's really, really complicated. And it's complicated because of conflict. It's not complicated because of a regulatory environment. It's not complicated because we don't know how to treat waste and we don't know how to treat water. It's complicated because, because of the, the conflict that resides behind the technologies. And that's what I think many people have not had a chance to be exposed to. And when working with students, and I do the same with EWB, these things need to be discussed. And it's not to say, let's not do the project, but let's think about the outcomes of the project. Where do you want to site the pit latrine you're going to build on your site visit to pick a country? Well, don't put it way out in the middle of nowhere so that the smells don't come to the houses. Put it where people can go and be safe. Those kinds of things are not oftentimes factored in. And then you wonder about the net outcome of the project. Did we do well? Did we create a new problem? You know, it, it, it's always very complicated. It's, but it's, a, it, it, it's the type of thing that people need to sit back and think about. Is there an answer for your question? I don't think so. But is there a reason to, to consider that in every project we do? Absolutely. So thank you for that question. John? Thank you, Joe, for such an inspirational talk. I, I really got a lot out of it. <clears throat> this is more of a comment. Than, uh, than a question. Um, it goes along the lines of sanitation and cre uh, providing clean water. Mm -hmm. In Burundi, to die young, you die when you're two. In Sweden, when you die young, you die at 63. Mm. Now, the reason I'm saying this is that the sanitation issue has a huge impact on population, I'll call it management. If you can get childhood mortality down to only 10, 10 to 20%, in other words, survivability, 80 to 90%, the number of children born to the women drops dramatically to the re replacement stage, about sure. 2.1. So this is really an important uh, co concept that we can engineer sanitation and water systems such that we can improve childhood mortality, uh, reduce it, I mean, and or sorry, survivability. So, and this sure. would have a huge impact on population control. Because as, as you mentioned, um, these women here, you. Uh, in, in uh, one of the one of the places, one of your case studies, we're having eight children, and the issue really is is that yes, some will die when they're young, but then more of them will become adults, and so the population increases. Sure, the the issue of of uh, infant mortality is is huge, um, and it very much centers around sanitation. I mean, it's 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 not the only factor. Nutrition is certainly another one, um, but it's it's one of the it's one of the, the big issues with regard to survivability. So eight children per woman lifetime with a 27 year life expectancy and a population growth rate of 1.4%. What does that tell you about survivability? Bruce. Yes, Joe. So thank you for your wonderful talk. Now. South Africa, I mean, this is a pretty sophisticated country, 
and you know, e you know, technically and politically sophisticated and economically pretty powerful. So, how is it that such a sophisticated country uh, could make such obvious errors? Conflict. Conflict means someone wins and someone loses. And when everything is based around did you win or did you lose, most people want to win. So you set it a lofty goal. And, and look, th this is not a statement, a political statement, about post-apartheid South Africa. Okay, please don't take it that way. But you set a goal and people agree to that goal, but many people did not think that it was a goal worthwhile. So what do you do? You put locks on the outside of the doors so that you can take the access away when you want to. You don't put the lock inside the door so that someone can use the facility and feel safe. I don't know about you, I'm not getting into a latrine where the lock is on the outside. Because I know what I gotta pay when I get out. Right, you gotta pay someone to unlock that door. So, yes, it's a sophisticated, I love South Africa. I've had, I've, I've had wonderful experiences in South Africa. The people are, have always been terrific to me. So this is in no way a statement about the people of South Africa. But the processes, the sanitation processes that were installed were installed in ways that you and I would never use them. Yet, they succeeded. They met their goal. And I haven't seen the Republican debates. I haven't seen the Democratic debates either. But it's all about winning and losing in a political format. And it's not necessarily about doing good. It's, it's, a, it's a depressing response. And it's not intended to infer anything about, about South Africans. But you meet your goal by building things that no one wants. And that's what's happened. Joe, we're going to take two more questions, and uh, Joan Rose is the next. Uh, thanks, Joe. I, I agree with you in, in terms of uh, this issue of goals and outcomes, and I'm, I'm glad to hear you, you talk about that. I'm wondering if you could mention uh, the role of the academic institution, because I read a, uh, recently a report that resilience was associated with the strength of institutions in countries, whatever the conflict was. Yeah. And what is our responsibility for institutions in these countries in, in uh, you know, building the, the educated populace within? Um, and could you talk about that a bit? Uh, yes, uh, a very good question. And something that's been uh, very frustrating uh, for me personally. Um, so for example, the ability for us to work jointly with universities in South Africa in an institutional manner, not in a faculty-to-faculty -faculty manner, but in an institutional manner. And there's some wonderful universities in South Africa. You know, Pretoria, Stellenbosch is terrific. Cape Town is a fantastic university. There's so many ways that great universities in the United States could be working with those universities and um, the exchange of ideas, the exchange of people, the exchange of technologies, et cetera, um, is extremely rich, in particular in South Africa. Some of the other countries, it gets a little bit thinner, uh, maybe too kind. Um, but we have institutional issues as it relates to the um, uh, status of those countries to receive funding, educational funding, um, in conjunction with U.S. universities. So, if I wanted to work with, let's say, Stellenbosch in South Africa, um, if they had their own money and I had my own money, and we said, let's work together, we can do that. But we can't come together, as we do in the States, between universities and write a joint pro a program grant. There's a few exceptions, mainly through the European Union, but they're highly competitive, and they oftentimes are favored to European universities as opposed to U.S. universities, which is fine. It's their money. Um, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on Capitol Hill to say that this is important 
It's important in terms of uh, growing the educational base in these countries. It's important for us to know, more specifically, what we're do how does what we do help in these environments. Um, and it would build tremendous trust across boundaries that have been really, really polluted. And, and so anybody who wants to go walk Capitol Hill with me and talk about this, there'll be a forum outside. Um, it, it, a lot of it resides within. I hope that answered your question. Joe, our last question is from uh, Sharon Walker from UC Riverside. Hi, Sarah. Hello. I enjoyed your talk very much. And actually, as a follow-up, I'll be happy to go to Capitol Hill with you. Okay. Because I had a wonderful grant by the Department of Agriculture that was allowing us to take students abroad to do exchanges, and they're no longer funding that. And now one can't use NSF funds for our international partners. We can visit them, but we can't you know, support them. And, and reimburse their expenses in, in hosting us. So it's a real challenge to expose our students to these concepts when we can't take them there. And Engineers Without Borders is a wonderful organization, but only takes a handful of students. And frankly, we serve an underserved population at our institution, and our students can't necessarily afford to give up the summer where they would be earning their college tuition to go build a latrine when they might be out landscaping with their family business, right, to earn their college tuition for the fall. So it's... it's um, very difficult to, to bring these developing wor world issues to our students. How do you propose bringing these to our engineering students in the classroom? If we can't take the students to the, to the developing world, how can we bring that to the classroom and, and work conflict and these public health issues into our curriculum? Boy, that's a tough question. Um, I can tell you what we're doing at Drexel. Um, and it's an, it's an experiment in the making, okay? So don't take this as me saying that we, we know what we're doing, but I can tell you what we're trying to do. Um, we signed a, an agreement this last June um, with an organization called the United States Institute of Peace. Um, very few people know much about that organization. Um, for those of you who don't, if you're ever at the Lincoln Monument, look across Constitution Avenue at a beautiful white building that's the shape of a dove, and that's the USIP. And their whole goal is to provide, it's a think tank, federally funded think tank, to provide diplomatic support to the Department of State, the Department of Defense, and to Congress. It's independent of the executive branch. Um, we are now teaching courses on what we call peace engineering. I don't know if that name's going to stick. Um, I've got a little coin, peace engineering, making nothing happen. Um, we offered two courses. We're on a quarter system. We offered two courses this fall, um, one taught by USIP, one taught by a former NASA astronaut. Um, the student response has been unbelievable. We had to cap enrollment after about three hours on both courses. Um, and the, both of the courses have to do, well, one of them is very much focused on conflict resolution. If you look around the country in engineering programs and you see where are courses offered in conflict resolution, it's almost exclusively in construction management programs where conflict is a different kind of conflict than we're talking about with nation state or non-nation state conflict. So this is conflict resolution from the perspective of uh, an organization that's focused on large-scale conflict resolution and diplomacy. The other course taught by Ron Garan, the astronaut, uh, he was in this, the orbiting space station for about 160 days and had an epiphany and wrote a book, and if you ever want to read a great book, it's an easy read on an on a airplane, called The Orbital Perspective. The epiphany was that when you're in space, you can't see very much of what's going on. You can see the Earth. I've never been up there, so I'm going by what he told me. Um, one thing that you can see from space is conflict. You can see war. And so, when you're floating around, looking at the earth and you're wondering what's going on 
you see war. And so he wrote this really, really interesting book, um, The Orbital Perspective. That's the second class. And the students that have lined up for that, you just can't imagine. There's a huge student interest. But you have to get into the instruction on conflict. And that's not what, I don't know, Jerry, you never taught me that. I guess I've been to enough faculty meetings. But they, but no, it's a very, it, it is actually a science. There's a lot into it. And I think we should engage those communities. So that's what we're trying. We'll, we'll see in a few years if it worked out. Thank you for the question. And uh, Joe, thank you for coming. It was great to have you here. We appreciate it. It was an honor.